The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 135, praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O you servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. For I know that the Lord is great, and our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth. In the seas and in all deep places, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. He defeated many nations and slew mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel, his people. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your fame, O Lord, throughout all generations, for the Lord will judge his people, and he will have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are like them, so is everyone who trusts in them. Bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Okay, we are in Deuteronomy chapter 7, it's verses 17 through 26. I think that finishes the chapter, yes. And this is called The Great and Awesome God. Starting in verse 17. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? While I'm reading this, think of your own salvation. Think of the battles you face and contemplate that. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So shall the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them until those who are left who hide themselves from you are destroyed. You shall not be terrified of them, for the Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you, little by little. You will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you, and will inflict defeat upon them until they are destroyed. And he will deliver their kings into your hand, and you will destroy their name from under heaven." No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. You shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not covet the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. There's a lot of repetition in our 10 verses today from the verses going all the way back to the book of Exodus. And much of what is said here will also be connected to a lot of what is coming in the time of the law. The Lord carefully weaves his word together in this way so that we will have a better grounding on what we might have misunderstood elsewhere. In other words, we may have come to some thought or word that was difficult, maybe because it was new or it was rare. In that, people could debate if what the Lord said is really the way we are interpreting it. But when the Lord restates things in various ways, and in adding in complementary thoughts to items he is repeating, we can be much sure of being accurate if we are willing to look through the entire picture. Unfortunately, that is a lot of laborious, 
tedious and mentally taxing work. It is something that few ever do. Because of this, we have all kinds of incorrect interpretations about how things work or what things mean. This is also why it is such a treasure for me, personally, to preach to the people who attend the Superior Word or who watch these videos later. Although it doesn't need to be said, simply by looking at the numbers, one can tell that each of you is a rare breed. Sermons are intended to be an analysis of God's Word, but they often are not. And even if they are, they don't contain as much detail as you all seem to find rewarding. So my hat is off to you. As you know, we have been in the five books of Moses now since 1837, <laughs> or somewhere around then, and we are steadily plugging through them. Some find no value in the law at all. Others find it too convicting. For whatever reason, people find other things to do than pursue what is stated in the books of Moses. However, they serve many great purposes, as we have seen over the past years. For the law itself, in Galatians, Paul gives us a couple of the many good reasons why we should know it. From Galatians chapter 3, our text verse, What purpose, then, does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture is confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our tutor, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Paul says the law was added because of transgressions. That actually makes a kind of a, if that is all there is to it. But it's not. He also tells us that the law is our tutor to bring us to Christ. When he said that, he was writing to the Galatians, a Gentile church that was never under the law, and yet he used the word Hour. The instruction is for everyone, if we will just pay heed. In knowing the law and its many, many limitations, we can then more fully understand and appreciate the grace which is found in Jesus Christ. Yes, Paul makes sure he tells us that we are no longer under a tutor, meaning the law, but how sad it is that many reject that premise. In truly knowing the law, we can then truly be appreciative of the grace of God which Jesus Christ means to us. We'll see some of that in relation to our conscience. What is impossible under the law because of conscience is allowable under grace because of the same thing. We needed this tutor to understand that. It is one of many wonderful truths we will see today, truths that are to be found in his superior word. And so let us turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have a couple of thoughts for you today. The first is, you shall not be terrified of them, verses 17 through 21. Verse 17, if you should say in your heart. The verse today begins with an idiom, ki tomar bilvavecha, if you should say in your heart. In the Bible, the heart is not the seat of emotions as it is with us. Rather, it is the seat of reasoning. One considers a matter and reasons it out. This is a personal inward reflection. However, the words here, like those of the previous verse, which ended us last week, are in the singular. It is the heart of the entire nation which is reflecting on a matter and considering it. And the matter is, verse 17 going on, these nations are greater than I. The entire nation's heart is questioned. We are Israel, and what we are to face in these many peoples is a sum that is far larger and more powerful than we are. The reasoning is made, and therefore the obvious question is next asked. Verse 17 going on, how can I dispossess them? The nations we face are greater. They are larger. They are more powerful. They dwell in fortified cities. They have supplies and weapons. They know the land, and so on. The reasoning out of the matter causes Israel to question. It is the prudent thing to do under normal circumstances. Even Jesus spoke of this. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? 
or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. This is what normally is expected. Battle means death, possible defeat, and thus subjugation and possibly more death. However, in the case of Israel, as they consider their entrance into and subduing of Canaan, the Lord next says, verse 18, you shall not be afraid of them. Lo tirah mehem. No, you shall be afraid of them. What Israel sees and what Israel considers of their own size, state, and abilities in relation to their foes is not even to be considered. Rather, they are to exhibit full confidence in their situation. It is a reminder that has often been repeated already, such as Deuteronomy chapter 1. Look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. The state of confidence, however, is not based upon who they are in relation to the enemy, but in relation to who their God is. Verse 18 going on, but you shall remember well. Zakor tizkor, remembering, you shall remember. The repetition of the word is given as a way of saying, you shall continuously call to mind this matter. Israel was to never forget what had transpired in their past so that they would always be prepared for their future. Verse 18 going on, what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. Again, the words are reflective of often repeated earlier words, such as Deuteronomy 1, the Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Israel was a nation of slaves held in bondage and unable to free themselves. And yet, in this state, they were brought out from that by the Lord. Pharaoh's rule over them ended, Egypt was destroyed as a military power, and Israel was freed, all without their own effort. As this was so in slavery, then it is a note of surety that the Lord had intentions for them that made it certain that they would endure and prevail in whatever else he directed them to do. Whatever was set before them, as long as it was ordained by him, it could not fail. Likewise, whatever they chose to do that was not authorized by him was sure to fail. Moses will not touch on this now, but it is a certain truth that should be called to mind. It is reflected in what was said in Numbers and was repeated in Deuteronomy 1. Then you answered and said to me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight just as the Lord our God commanded us. And when every one of you had girded on his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the mountain. And the Lord said to me, Tell them, do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you, lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, yet you would not listen, but rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously went up into the mountain. Then the Amorites who dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do and drove you back from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. Israel's actions are to be conducted solely by how the Lord directs them. In telling them to go, they are to go, and they will prevail. In telling them to stand fast, if they disobeyed that order, they would fail. All of this is taken from the view of what occurred in Egypt. It is the lesson of being released from the bondage of Egypt that was to be the preeminent reminder of their future conduct at all times. As Moses next says, verse 19, the great trials which your eyes saw. Hamasot hagedolot asher rau enecha. The trials, the greats which saw your eyes. Moses will now focus on events that actually occurred. Israel was in a foreign land. They were unable to free themselves. No other group or people defeated Egypt, and yet they were freed. It was solely by the divine workings of the Lord that it came about. Here Moses begins a list of five descriptors concerning this magnificent event. The first is Hamasot Hagedolot, or the trials, the greats. Masa is a word derived from the verb nasa, which signifies to try. This is probably speaking of the trials the people faced before Moses' arrival. Israel was in hard bondage, they were afflicted, and they were tested. In this state, Exodus 2 says, Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. It is obvious that they could not free themselves. 
They were in anguish and cried out because of it. From there, the Lord heard and responded. Moses next tells them how. Israel also saw, verse 19 continues, the signs, veha otot, and the signs. Otot, or signs, are things given to represent something else. The Lord gave Moses three signs to give to Israel, the rod which turned into a snake, the leprous hand, and the water which turned to blood. He also gave signs to Pharaoh concerning what would come upon them as the Lord accomplished his work. Next, verse 19 going on, and the wonders, veha mofetim, and the wonders. Mofet, or wonder, comes from yafa, which means beautiful. Therefore, they speak of that which is conspicuous or amazing. This word then refers to the plagues that came upon the land. But equally wondrous is the fact that Israel was spared at the same time. While Egypt was destroyed, Israel survived through the plagues. Each such occurrence was a wonder in itself. Next, verse 19 continues, the mighty hand. Ve hayad ha And the hand, the mighty. The hand is what accomplishes things. Moses is saying that it was by the strength of the Lord's hand, his power, which is mighty. And these things came about and how they were displayed. And more, verse 19 going on, and the outstretched arm. Ve ha ha And the arm outstretched. The zeroa or arm, comes from the word zara, which means to sow or to scatter seed. One can see the arm extending as it does. In this, you can think of the Lord reaching out over all of Egypt. Nothing was hidden from his reach to destroy, and nothing was left as an obstacle before Israel once his arm had cleared the way. As it next says, verse 19 going on, by which the Lord your God brought you out. Asher hutziacha Yehovah Elohecha, which brought you out Jehovah your God. It is speaking of all five of the descriptors mentioned in this verse. Together, the Lord combined them into one awesome display of his ability and capability to accomplish the feat of bringing Israel out from under the huge weight and burden of Egyptian bondage. It cannot go without reminder at this point that the Lord bringing Israel out of Egypt is a direct analogy to him bringing each person out of their bondage to sin. We have to constantly remind ourselves of this as we progress through the book of Deuteronomy. Israel was in physical bondage. We were in spiritual bondage. The Lord accomplished the great trials, the signs, and the wonders, and he did it by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. It was by his power and his clearing the way for us that this was made possible. In this passage, Moses is asking his people to not fear the enemies that they will face. Likewise, in Christ... We are not to fear the enemies that we face, even up to our greatest enemy, which is death. As Paul says, so when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who brings us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Bible, for example, in Ephesians chapter 6 says that we are in a battle against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, if you're not a Christian, you might not believe that. But once you become a Christian, you will understand it perfectly. And the thing is that I was talking to somebody about uh, coming to Christ a day ago, and you you don't understand until you yield yourself to Christ. And then all of a sudden you say, why didn't I do this 50 years ago? Uh I mean, it it, it becomes so clear when you simply take your heart and you say, I'm going to trust this person that's described in the Word of God, this God that came to dwell among us in the form of a human being. But we just don't think about those things in this life, and we get misdirected, and we have all of these problems, and Then when you come to Christ, you realize that all your life you were in a spiritual battle. Does everybody remember that? I remember it. It was like it was yesterday. What we are seeing in Israel being admonished to not fear the enemy because the Lord has already proven himself to them, we are likewise to see concerning not fearing our enemies because the Lord has already proven himself to us. The battle and the victory belong to the Lord. As Moses next says, verse 19 going on, So shall the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. 
In verse 18, Moses said, you shall not be afraid, using the verb yare, to be afraid. Here it says, the peoples of whom you are afraid, using the adjective yare, fearful. This is just how we are as well. We are fearful of sickness. We're fearful of wicked people. We're fearful of death. But we are told to not be afraid of them. As the Lord has done to sickness, the wicked, and death at the cross, so he will do for us when the time for him to bring us across into the promise arrives. It is certain that soldiers of Israel died in battle, but Israel survived. We may die in our battle, but we shall also surely survive. Where the enemy is seen to get the upper hand in humanity, it is only a temporary thing for the redeemed of the Lord. Verse 20, Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them. Here the sirah, or hornet, is mentioned for the second of only three times in the Bible. The verb comes from tsara, which means leprous. If you went through the uh, Leviticus sermons, you probably heard that word, what, 10,000 times? I think it was uh, Leviticus 13. Also, it is a singular noun with an article in front of it, the hornet. Thus, the language is to be taken metaphorically, although some scholars demand a literal interpretation. Hence, I'm going to give you a long talk about why it's not literal. And the reason why I'm doing that is because if you read commentaries, so many commentators say, oh yeah, hornets really chase these people. So here we go. Similar terminology is used concerning bees in Deuteronomy 1:44 and Psalm 118, verse 12. There, they are equated with one's enemies. In fact, I quoted one of those a little earlier in the sermon, not literal insects. Secondly, Joshua says that this was fulfilled in the case of the Amorites in Joshua 24, where he said, I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you. Also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. There it said it was the hornet that drove out the two kings of the Amorites. And yet Moses, speaking of the same battle, shows that it was, in fact, Israel who defeated them. From Deuteronomy 3, And at that time we took the land from the hand of the two kings of the Amorites who were on this side of the Jordan, from the river Arnon to Mount Hermon. This was repeated in Deuteronomy 4.47, and it was referring to the kings Sihon and Og. My take on it is that this is referring to a connection between the hornet and its associated word meaning leprosy. The Lord promised health and long life to Israel if they held to his laws. As they were going into a land defiled by those things which are opposed to a healthy lifestyle, the enemy had been or would be afflicted with disease to the point where they were incapable of standing up to Israel's armies. Thus, the hornet is a metaphor for God's judgment of sickness upon them, preparing them for destruction by Israel. The Bible records that Israel actually faced these foes in battle. And so it is a reasonable explanation for the term the hornet, which is said to have gone before them. Verse 20 continues, until those who are left who hide themselves from you are destroyed. Ad avod hanisharim veha nistarim, until destroyed the remainers and the hiders from you. It shows that the words the hornet are to be taken figuratively. Indiscriminate killing of people around the land of Israel by hornets is far less likely than the effects of being in hiding from the forces of Israel during times of deprivation, disease, and physical bodily ailments. The same types of effects are noted upon the people of Israel during their own times of siege from the enemies who came against them. The overall evidence pretty clearly shows that the words the hornet are speaking of the effects upon the people as a result of the destruction of them and their cities by Israel, as the Lord led them. This is again noted by Moses' next words. Verse 21, you shall not be terrified of them. Lo ta'arots mi penechem. No, you shall be terrified from their faces. This isn't simply speaking of their mean countenances, but of their numbers. Moses is still speaking to Israel in the singular and as a collective body, but he refers to the enemy in the plural. It is a way of saying, it may be one against many, but do not be terrified. This is because, verse 21 continues, for the Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. Ki Yehovah Elohecha bikerbecha el gadol venora. For Yehovah your God in your midst, God great and to be feared. It is an adjective and then a verb which are used to describe the Lord. Moses reminds them that he is in the midst of Israel, ever present with them. 
it is a note of absolute assurance that he can be relied upon in battle. I would personally take these words as a warning to Israel, though. In verse 18, they were told to not fear using the verb yare. Here, it says that the Lord is feared using the same word. One must choose who he will fear. This is especially so because the final two verses of the chapter indicate that the Lord is watching the actions of Israel at the same time he is actively working for Israel in the destruction of their enemies. As long as Israel fears the Lord, they will not fall under the judgment of the Lord. But when they turn to the images and idols of the people they are instructed to destroy, they are no longer showing a fear for the one who is to be feared. Israel cannot have it both ways, nor can we. As long as we fear the consequences of our actions, we will not conduct ourselves in negative ways. But when one fears a negative outcome, he will remain vigilant to ensure that doesn't come about. The same God who ruled over Israel and who continues to do so today is the same God we are each accountable to for our own actions. As for Israel entering Canaan, Moses continues after a short poetic break. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, the Lord brought you out of Egypt the land. Through it all, you suffered no harm, and now at Canaan's door, you stand. Do not fear what the inhabitants can do. The Lord has shown you his greatness already. He will remain constant and faithfully true. So do not fear, rather remain sure and steady. Do not fear and do not be afraid. The great and awesome God is among you. Do not be so easily swayed. The Lord our God is faithful and true. Our second thought today is an accursed thing. It's verses 22 through 26. Verse 22, And the Lord your God will drive out those nations. Venashal Yehovah Elohecha et Hagoyim Ha'el. And will clear away Yehovah your God, the nations, the these. Moses uses the same rare word that he used in verse 7 1, Nashal. It means to slip off, draw off, or clear away. He again promises that the Lord will be the one to draw the people off of the land just as a person draws off his shoe. Moses says to Israel that they are those who, verse 22 going on, are before you. Me panecha, from your face. In the previous verse, he told them not to be terrified, me panechem, or from their faces. Now he tells Israel that they will be removed, me panecha, or from your face. It is beautifully worded, showing the complete contrast between the two. Next, he says the Lord will do this, verse 22 going on, little by little, me'at, me'at, little, little. This tells them that the process will be solely at the direction of the Lord. It is a certainty that the inhabitants are to be driven out. However, there is an incremental process which is to take place. All advances will be when he determines, not all at once, as Israel would certainly be inclined to want to do. How often we look at the Lord's plans as if he is slacking, but this is not the case. It is only from our short lifespans and eagerness to get on with things that we decide things should move more quickly. Understanding this, Moses says, verse 22 continues, you will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. The same basic thought of this verse in Deuteronomy is also given in Exodus 23, but there are some differences. From Exodus 23, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. One difference is that here it says you will be unable to destroy them. And in Exodus 23, it says, I will not drive them out from before you. It is obvious that the actions of Israel are said to be ultimately accomplished by the Lord. What he does not want to come to pass will not come about. Also, here in Deuteronomy, it leaves off the thought of the land becoming desolate. But it's an important point to be reminded of. If all of the inhabitants were taken out at once, the land would become desolate. The land of Canaan was inhabited. There were fields, crops, fruit trees, wells, houses, and so on. If all of the people were taken out at once, there would have been an insufficient number of people to take them over. All of that productivity would have been lost. But more, with land standing idle and not being properly cultivated, animals would multiply. The word translated as beasts here signifies living things. If you have fruit trees that aren't tended to, what are you going to have? 
rats, they're going to multiply. If you have rats, you will have disease. And other animals feed on rats, so they too will quickly multiply. Cats, dogs, and so on. Very quickly, you would have many animals, some of them disease-filled, and so on. This exact scenario occurred after the exile of the northern tribes of Israel, as is seen in Two Kings. And it was so at the beginning of their dwelling there that they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. Lions are but one species that would quickly multiply as they fed off the rats and the other little animals that were busy feeding off of the unattended fruit trees and the like. This is also documented in more recent history after wars where areas were highly depopulated. In fact, the comparable sermon that we did back in the book of Exodus, I recorded that, something I think from after the First World War in France where exactly that happened. The Lord knew these things would occur, and so he determined to methodically take care of the occupation of Canaan. Verse 23, but the Lord your God will deliver them over to you. Unetanam Yehovah Elohecha lefanecha, and will give them Yehovah your God to your face. It is a note of surety following on after the note of gradual accomplishment. Moses is assuring them that even if it seems that the process is slow, it will be accomplished according to the will of the Lord. The fact that this later does not fully come to pass does not mean that the Lord failed. Rather, it means that Israel failed. What he will warn about in the coming verses is exactly what Israel will fail to do. When that occurs, the Lord will then amend the process according to their disobedience. That will be seen as we continue. For now, Moses says that the Lord will deliver these people over to Israel, but then he continues by saying, verse 23 going on, and will inflict defeat upon them until they are destroyed. Vehamam mehuma gedola ad hisham medam. And confusing disquietude greatly until they are destroyed. The words are full of action in life as they proceed from a verb, followed by a noun, and then to an adjective. Here is a new word in scripture, mehuma, which I have translated as disquietude. It is a noun signifying tumult, confusion, disquietude, discomfiture, and the like. Both it and the previous word, hamam, come from the same root, hum. That signifies murmur, roar, agitate, make an uproar, and so on. Thus, both words are onomatopoetic expressions where the sound gives the sense of what is going on. There's turmoil, there's panic, and so on, as the Lord brings great agitation and uproar among them. The divine judgment of the Lord that is anticipated upon the inhabitants is marvelously vocalized by Moses. And this divine judgment will not be limited to any single class of people. From the least even to the greatest, all of the people of Canaan are promised to be delivered into the hand of Israel. Verse 24, and he will deliver their kings into your hand. Venatan malchehem beyadecha, and will give their kings into your hand. As has been the case throughout this passage, Moses continues to speak in the singular, their kings into your singular hand. Israel is one, they are many, and yet Israel will prevail. Once the king is subdued, it is taken as an axiom that the people are likewise subdued. This conquering of the kings is poignantly noted in Joshua chapter 10. There it says, then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings to me from the cave. And they did so and brought out those five kings to him from the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. So it was when they brought out those kings to Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said to the captains of the men of war who went with him, come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. And they drew near and put their feet on their necks. Then Joshua said to them, do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. The account goes on to say that Joshua then struck the kings, killing them. Then they were hanged on five trees until evening. This was in compliance with the next words. Verse 24 continues, and you will destroy their name from under heaven. Ve'ha'abadta et shemam mitachat hashemayim. And cause to perish their names from under the heavens. The word heavens is plural. Here it is not speaking of heaven in the sense of the Lord's dwelling place, but of everywhere under the skies. And more, this is not saying that their names will literally perish as to never be heard again. 
They are clearly recorded right here in scripture for us to know who they were. The idea is that there will be no continuance of them, such as in progeny. Their names were to die with them. This is what is explicitly said to be done to Amalek later in Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 through 19. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks and all the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary. And he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. There was to be nothing left of Amalek just as there was to be nothing left of the names of any of the other peoples and kings who dwelt in the land of Canaan. They were to be destroyed until they were completely eradicated. And it was fully possible because the Lord promises it would be so. Verse 24 going on, no one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. Lo yit yatsev ish befanecha ad hish midcha otam. No shall stand man in your face until you have destroyed them. As always, the words in your face or similar phrases are a literal translation meaning before or in the presence of. Moses assures Israel that not only will the kings be destroyed, but not even a man of any state or stature will be able to stand before Israel. However, the promise is conditional. It required faith that the words of Moses were true. In this, we see the abject failure of the ranks of Israel who stood listening to Goliath's taunts for 40 days. He was one man, but every man in all of the ranks of Israel failed to simply trust the Lord and take the words of Moses at face value. That is, until a young shepherd boy on a mission from his father called this precept to their attention, and then who followed through with his own example of his faith in what Moses now says. To believe Moses is to believe the Lord who inspired Moses to issue forth these words. And he continues with verse 25, you shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. Peseli Elohehem Tishrefun Ba'esh. Carved images, their gods, you shall burn in the fire. In this clause alone, the words go from the second person singular to the second person plural. And more. The verb, you shall burn, is, like in verse 7, 5, accentuated with a suffix, causing it to be emphasized. Make sure you do this. There was to be no tolerance for allowing them to continue in the form they were in. Further, verse 25 continues, you shall not covet the silver or gold that is on them. The act of coveting is forbidden in the 10th commandment. Therefore, to simply covet what was on an idol would be sin. But more. The fact that it was on an idol only exacerbated the problem. If the idol was kept, that would be sin. If only what was on the idol was kept, it would lead to other problems next noted. Verse 25 going on, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it. Here's a new word, the verb yakosh. It signifies to lay a bait or a snare. Why would taking the precious part of the carved image while destroying the rest of it be a snare? It is understood by Moses how precious both silver and gold are. It would normally seem right to melt off the metal from the idols and then reuse it for something else, wouldn't it? However, this is absolutely forbidden. At times, the precious metals taken from devoted villages could be claimed by Israel. For example, now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction. It and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So it's okay if the Lord says to keep the precious metals, right? The silver and gold and the other metals could be saved and reused. But all idols and carved images were devoted to the ban and were to be utterly destroyed. This included anything they were plated or adorned with. If such were reused, it would enter into the public monetary system. And it would be known, for example, that the silver of idols was acceptable to be used in the payment of temple taxes and so forth. Such could never be the case simply for conscience sake. 
The snare that was laid is that of knowing that what was intended for the worship of false gods was acceptable to be used towards offerings to the true God. There was to be no hint of mixing the profane with that which is holy. The heavy stress of this is explained with the next words. Verse 25 continues, For it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Ki to'avat Yehovah Elohecha hu. For abomination to Yehovah your God, it. The Lord detested what it was. Changing its form doesn't change what it was previously used for in the minds of the people. Gold is gold and silver is silver. But when the people knew the source of it, the conscience of the people is defiled. In this, the Lord cannot be placed alongside that which is profane in the minds of the people. The precept is clearly explained by Paul concerning meats in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if they are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all are all things and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. Paul goes on to say this in 1 Corinthians 10, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you, asking no question for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But I, if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? Does everybody understand that now? These idols had gold and silver on them, and if that got into the public supply, the people's minds would be defiled, saying this is okay to be used for the service of the Lord. But in Christ, that conscience is eliminated. Only against another person is it not eliminated. But for those in Christ, we can eat anything and we just don't have to ask. It doesn't matter because the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. If you don't understand those verses from 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 11, we've already done the study. They're on YouTube. They're important to remember because your conscience is A-OK. -okay. You see how the law is a tutor to bring us to Christ. And in Christ, the law is set aside. As you can see in this case, what is an abomination to the Lord in the Mosaic Covenant is so because of conscience. The law, as was clearly seen in our text verse, is simply a tutor to instruct the people in the propriety of proper conduct before the Lord, meaning a life of proper conscience. Earlier, I said that the promise of the Lord's driving the people out was conditional. The words of this verse and the destroying of such forbidden things shows that this is so. In Judges 2, we read the following. Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side and their God shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Then they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. And when Joshua dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. The people failed to do what the Lord said. They did what was contrary to his will, and therefore he altered the promises given by Moses now. Unfortunately, they continued to suffer through this type of disobedience until there was no remedy left and they went into exile. Their rejection of the law brought about many woes upon them, and that continues to this day, whether they realize it or not. 
Verse 26, nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. We come to the last verse of the chapter with these words. Moses uses the same word translated as abomination as in the previous verse. The word extends beyond just carved images to anything the Lord proclaims is detestable or abominable. The people were to separate themselves from such things. If they failed to do so, they would come under the same ban that was to be levied upon the banned thing. This is exactingly seen in the account of Achan in Joshua chapter 7. He failed to heed, and thus he and his entire household were utterly destroyed. Moses warns in advance, but it took a painful lesson in life for the truth of the words to be revealed. In hopes of avoiding that, however, Moses proceeds with, verse 27 going on, you shall utterly detest it. Shaketz tesh aketsenu, detesting it, you shall detest it. The emphasis is given to highlight the importance of the act. Further, verse 26 continues, and utterly abhor it. And abhorring, you shall abhor it. It is a new word in scripture derived from the word translated as abomination in the previous verses. They were to actively find abominable that which the Lord declares an abomination. Moses then explains why. Verse 26 finishes with, for it is an accursed thing. Ki harem hu, for devoted thing, it. The word harem signifies devoted to a particular purpose. In this case, it is in the sense of being banned or under a curse and thus devoted to God through destruction. A New Testament equivalent would be the word anathema. Something in this state is intolerable to God and must be destroyed. In the Old Testament, as a tool of learning for Israel, things as are described here are noted as such. In the New Testament, Paul equates one who abuses the gospel as such. We will see that in our closing verse today. The Lord has given man certain instructions at certain times in redemptive history. But the lesson continuously points to the same truths. Faith, conscience, reliance on the Lord and not ourselves, and a complete and total trust in, reliance on, and adherence to His Word. Whatever we do that is not in accord with that, we will fall into error. It happened in Eden. It happened with the covenant people. It happened throughout the time of the Mosaic Law. And it continues on today, literally, throughout His church. The word is given. A context is to be maintained. And within that context, we are to live out our lives in his presence. But through all of the times of man's failings, for those who are within the covenant offered by the Lord, there is also the opportunity to receive his grace. This is the best part of it all. Man is limited and troubled by time, circumstances, stresses, temptation, and so on. God understands this, and he is there with us, knowing what we are going through because he himself was willing to share in our humanity. And because of this, we have a great high priest who can sympathize with us. He understands our failings, and he offers us his grace when we come to him. Without it, all there is left for humanity is remaining under the ban and being consigned to the trash heap of human history. I would hope better for you. Receive God's offer of pardon in the giving of his son and be reconciled to him to live out better days, eternal days in his glorious presence. This is the message of the Bible. And we keep seeing this woven through Moses' words. We're seeing law, we're seeing law, we're seeing law. And all of this is being heaped upon the people. And yet even through it, we're seeing grace. We're understanding our need for what the law only pointed to, Jesus Christ. Does everybody see that in these verses today? I mean, you read them and you don't think of it. But when you stop and you just go through them in your mind and you say, wow, look at what God is doing through these people, how he's revealing himself and his intentions for us so that when Christ comes, there will be no mistake at his coming. And yet the people failed to see it. And so the message has gone out into the world. The grace of God through Jesus Christ has gone all over this world to the Gentile peoples of the world. And Israel is still under the same bondage. But someday, they will be brought back into a covenant relationship with him. And man, I hope that day is soon. There's a couple reasons for that. One is because I love Israel just as a concept. Not so much the people, but as a concept. God has made this promise, and he is going to bring it to pass. Yes, I love the people of Israel, but because they are the people of Israel. Once again, God has used them in this wonderful way. But there's another reason, because when Israel calls on the Lord as Savior, we will have been out of here for at least seven years. 
and I'm hoping to be out of here really soon. You know, not just because of the elections, but because of getting older and getting a backache, of seeing things devolving in the world, and for whatever other reason that this world really isn't our home, is it? We're living here and we have to live here, and we might as well excel at it while we're here. I mean, do your best. Do your very best at everything you do and excel at it. Don't just say, oh, the rapture's going to happen next week, and so I'm going to take it easy. I went through that in 2005. No kidding. And I said, I'll never do that again. I am going to go full steam for Christ until he comes, and I'm not going to waste another day. All right? That's what we need to do. But until he comes, let us just keep going. But before that happens, you have to call on Jesus and be saved. You have to believe in Jesus. You have to say, I understand that this man came out of the eternal realm to redeem me, and he died for my sins, implying I am a sinner. And then you believe that he was in the grave. He was there for, you know, the entire weekend, and he came out of the grave early Sunday morning to prove that he is God and that he had no sin because the wages of sin is death. He would have still been in the grave if he had sinned, but he came out because death could not hold him. Praise be to God for Jesus Christ. Our closing verse comes from Galatians chapter 1. I promised you I would give you a New Testament equivalent of the word harem or anathema, curse, devoted to destruction. Here it is. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, meaning the grace of Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. I added in the words meaning the grace of Jesus Christ. I don't want to add to the Bible and have somebody have that in their head. But that's what he's talking about, okay? Next week, Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 9. Understanding this, you will be in the sweet zone. It's entitled, Man Shall Not Live by Bread Alone. That'll be your 29th Deuteronomy sermon. I'll tell you as I do each week that the Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you, but he also has expectations of you as you prepare for your entrance into the land of promise. And so follow him and trust him, and he will do marvelous things for you and through you, okay? Good stuff. Now I have a question for you. This is um, uh, from verse 24 of today's sermon. We talked about, um, and you will destroy their name from under heaven, okay? Saul was told to destroy what group of people and what was the king's name? Oh. Say it again. Oh. Saul was told to destroy what group of people? This is why he lost the kingship and it went to David. Amalek and what was the king's name? I know it. I know. As soon as I say it, you're going to kick yourself right in the teeth. Agog. Agog, king of the... Uh, okay, well... You get a half of a ride on a YF-22 today because you did say Amalek. I'll, I'll take you and taxi around and then we'll come back. Well, I don't know. It's the same root of the word. It is. That's true. But the one thing about Agag is that when you get to the book of Esther, you have the, uh, what's his name, Haman the Agagite, and he is descended from them. And you can follow that genealogy and you can see how the Lord is working all of these things out in redemptive history. Rather amazing. Okay, we got a poem and we'll take the uh, Lord's Supper. This is called The Great and Awesome God. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? From me, my life will be stripped. You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. The great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders when you gave a shout, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So shall the Lord your God do as in those acts he displayed to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them until those who are left, who hide themselves from you, are destroyed. Of their lives they will be bereft. You shall not be terrified of them. This you shall not do. For the Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little, so he will do. You will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you. This tactic will be employed and will inflict defeat upon them until they are destroyed. And he will deliver their kings into your hand and you will destroy from under heaven their name. 
No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. Such is the aim. You shall burn the carved images of their God with fire. You shall not covet on them silver or gold, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God, so you have been told. Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. Hear what I say. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. Yes, hear my words this day. Lord God, turn our hearts to be obedient to your word. Give us wisdom to be ever faithful to you. May we carefully heed each thing we have heard. Yes, Lord God, may our hearts be faithful and true. And we shall be content and satisfied in you alone. We will follow you as we sing our songs of praise. Hallelujah to you, to us your path you have shown. Hallelujah. We shall sing to you for all of our days. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, Thank you for this wonderful lesson. Oh, week after week, there's just joy coming out of this book of Deuteronomy. Less pictures of Christ, but in the end, there are actually more pictures of Christ because he is the embodiment of everything we're seeing. Every law that's given, every warning that was made, every single thing that is given in these may not be a picture of Jesus, but they show the embodiment of what he went through for us and how wonderful that is. Thank you, Lord God, for sending Jesus Christ, our Lord, to fulfill this impossible body of law and to use Israel as a lesson for us to see and to understand the great grace which is bestowed upon us in his coming. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the shed blood which covers us and makes us acceptable in your sight once again. Praise be to God for Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to take the Lord's Supper. That comes directly from the Bible. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And there Paul wrote these words. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And he would have blessed that. He would have said, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it, and you said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed this as well. He would have said, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGuffin. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The 
the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good to have your neck. For those that don't know him, this is my son-in-law, my daughter's husband. Oh. <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Skipper. Jesus Christ. Oh, so you got it. I remember. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good to have you guys here. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The what? The what? Your ID. Yes, it does. Oh, did you see it? There you go. I had a little on top. Yeah. It wasn't on the bottom of the tank. Oh, no. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's cute. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you okay? Okay. Okay. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good to have you, Brian. Mm -hmm. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings of this life. And we know that there are people that are suffering. We went through quite a few names on Thursday, and a couple here again today. And we also want to remember baby Easton, who's doing better, but a couple things that we want to add in, praying for him as well. Lord, we know you're attentive to these things, and sometimes it seems like it's slow or it's not working out, but everything happens as it should. Nothing is out of your control. And we do continue to pray for the elections. They have not been called. They've only been uh, attempted to be stealed, stolen away from us. And whether that happens or not, we leave it in your hands. But until the day that this is decided by the courts of the United States of America, we continue to pray, lifting up our voices in a united way, praying to you to uh, work whatever way that you find is appropriate to the situation. And we will be content with it because we know we have a better end no matter what happens. We love you and we praise you for how great and glorious you are. And we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.